From the news team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday. It's our show about the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. Happy New Year, everyone. Over the past two years now, we've learned so much about how to adapt to changes that are just mostly beyond our control, but this year brings a new approach. The pandemic hasn't gone anywhere, but things, they feel different. We are different. Sure, we can't control for the future any better than we've ever been able to, but we've learned so much by this point about how to manage through ambiguity. And this is the year that we choose change. It's the year of reinvention. This kind of change is at the very heart of Hello Monday. If you want to have interesting work that pays well over the long arc of your career, you have to be willing to take risks, to learn new ways of doing things, to reinvent yourself. And as you all know, I'm walking the walk here. I spent two decades as a happily employed magazine writer at a media company, and then I gave it all up to make podcasts at a tech company. Different job, different medium, different industry. Best thing I've done. But wow, was it scary at the time. This year, we're going deep on reinvention. We're gonna bring you shows about people who made radical career changes, We're going to talk to people who changed cultures and companies and people who changed their mindsets in ways they really didn't think possible. I'll look for people who have tools to make change easier or whose stories make us braver. And this year, I want to hear even more from you, listeners. As I was thinking about reinvention, I started to listen to past episodes. I do that sometimes to get inspiration, to figure out what I'm really thinking about. And so I wanted to start this year's conversation, and that's really how I'm thinking about it, a year-long conversation about reinvention, by figuring out what the show has taught us so far. So here goes. First, change often starts with a feeling. You know this feeling. A nagging, dull sensation that things just aren't quite right. Robin Arzon describes it well. Robin's the head instructor at Peloton. She's the person who reminds me every morning as I sweat through her class, You didn't wake up to give up. But this kind of coaching, it's not what Robin started out doing. Well, I find for ambitious people, it's actually pretty easy to find an intellectual pursuit that we find interesting, even if the the subject matter is dry. So I did, I was a corporate litigator. I worked with a lot of SEC stuff. This was at the height of subprime. So it was a very tense time in the market. And I was able to focus and adapt and just dig in. And I think intellectual folks often find that it's, it's maybe not easy, but it's simple to just dig in. But that doesn't mean that it's actually aligning with our, with our values, with our goals and with a happiness quotient. That is something that I discovered when I was leading a divorce existence between athletics and law. So what I liked about law, I worked with brilliant partners. I learned about business. I think through osmosis, I would not have viewed fitness as a business and myself, frankly, as a brand, as a burgeoning brand then, um, had I not worked in corporate litigation. But I also knew that there was something palpably missing when I would count down the hours in my day until I could go for a 30 minute run in Central Park. So that that divorce existence was not satisfying. And that running piece, I was surprised to discover that you actually hadn't Grown up, if, you'd, if you had loved law at 10, you did not love running at 10, right? <laughs> no, I, I, w- I was allergic to exercise. Well, actually, into, into adulthood, I was, the, I was the arts and crafts and straight A student. I did not identify as an athlete. I was petrified of gym class. I actually was made fun of for the way I ran when I was a kid. So I think that that, that stuck in my brain early as something that I didn't do. And I had to really recreate myself and start to write a different story once I realized that I was curious about what this running thing was. <laughs> How did you come to running? Frankly, it was really through trauma. I was in law school and the prior year in my senior year at NYU, I was held at gunpoint in New York City and that experience understandably stayed with me. A year later, when I was in law school, I realized, wow, I guess I didn't really deal with as much of this as I thought I had. And I have no idea why, but I was drawn to a pair of shoes that were in the back of my closet collecting dust. And I decided to jog to class one day instead of, you know, drive the mile and a half. And that is where that was really where my journey started. Wow. And from a mile and a half, you've moved on to 50 miles at a pub. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ultra marathon <laughs> territory. So during your the remainder of your path through school and 
during the beginning years of your law practice, fitness was increasingly important to you. When and how did the way that you feel about it really start to change? It was a slow burn, I would say, because they ran in parallel tracks, you know, no pun intended, where I really was still at the nascency of my law career and feeling like, what's more? And I and while I was falling, falling in love with running, I was also getting curious about what's it like to be in-house? What's it like to be to practice different areas of law? You know, I dabbled in trademarks. I had IP stuff. So I was still kind of just trying to see if I could make the passion I found in the run, something that I could find in my day-to-day law practice. And because I was so new, having practiced only a few years, I thought there's got to be something out there that I haven't considered. Um, And it was in that search, actually, that I started to realize if I uncheck all the boxes of what folks say you could do in journalism or using the written word or storytelling within wellness, which is really where my mind was going, I thought maybe I can create a career um, that hasn't really happened before. That was 18 months before Robin joined Peloton. And I love the way she describes this. She didn't know exactly what she wanted to do. She made it up as she went along. Because Robin's job, like a lot of jobs, it didn't really exist before a few years ago. How would you even describe it? Like fitness instructor slash entertainer slash social media influencer, it's kind of hard to slot into a traditional resume. Robin literally designed the role herself, and that's what many of us aspire to do. So how exactly do we do it? Dave Evans and Bill Burnett have some helpful thoughts on this. They're designers, and they teach one of the most popular courses at Stanford. It's called Designing Your Life, and now it's a book, too. Here's the big idea. Dave speaks first. The way I describe it, the way we describe it at the D School is there's a bunch of different ways of solving problems, different ways of thinking. And what a lot of people are trying to do is kind of engineer their life. Engineering thinking is I've got the I've got all the data and I've got the equations. I can build this bridge. I can I can solve this problem. There's a right answer. But you know, the problem with life is it's an emerging reality. So what's gonna happen six months from now, a year from now, you don't know. I don't know. There's no way to predict that. I, I tell my students you only have two choices because the future's coming. Right. So you can accept the default thing and just kind of try to react to it. Or as Dave said, you can imagine it as a giant design problem or an improv problem. There's always something that you can design into. And so it's an inherently optimistic way of thinking about, well, change is change. It's going to happen. But I have, some, I have some power over how that change impacts me and what I take advantage of when I move into that future. So design thinking is an innovation methodology – Uh, to invent things that have not been invented before, and we don't know what they are until we find them, by using ideation and prototype iteration. So if you want the whole thing in a nutshell, and I'm in the car and I'm at a stoplight, okay, what do I need to do? Get curious, talk to people, try stuff, and tell your story. Now, we got to unpack that, but if you double-click on each of those, you get some some feedback. But that's it. Get curious, talk to people, try stuff, tell your story. Ten words. That's really what we mean. Well, I love that framing so much because I may not have the language that you have to describe it, but that has been what I have figured out in the first 40 some odd years of my life. About yeah, good how job. I learned new things about <laughs> right. myself, right? right? Maybe if I had gotten your framework when I was 20, I would have figured that out a lot earlier. I don't know. But I love that you ground this. The first thing that you ask people to do is to accept where they are. Right. Yeah. Step, we call it step <laughs> zero. Um, design only works in one place reality. This magical thinking stuff, you know, should is in your head. The only place should exists is in your head. Most people's definition of how happy they are, coming back to happiness, is what is the current referendum gap between what's going on in the real world and what I had in mind? If that gap is large, how's it going? Poorly. If that gap is small, how's it going? Well. So I guess the entire definition of my state of being as a human being on the surface of the earth is defined by some stuff I just made up. So we don't start with that. We start with reality, like what's actually going on and where can we get to from here? So we're reality-based. Well, so let's talk about change a second. Okay. I recently was at an event with Adam Grant and we were talking about various ways that you could be better at your job. And Mm -hmm. and I asked, do you you think people can change? Uh, Do you take your own advice? He said, I don't take my own advice. (laughs) It's very hard. Um, 
Which is why your idea, which is that it's about the little incremental change that you can make and celebrate, kind of makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. first of all, Adam's a great guy. We think his stuff is cool. Um, <laughs> he and, is great. Yeah, and he and he's kind of part of the design, you know, the the inner design mafia. I guess there's a lot of research on how you actually make change in your life. Either getting rid of a bad habit, I want to stop smoking or doing something, you know, something, or adding a new habit, I want to eat healthier or I want to, you know, practice mindfulness. And all of the research says it you fail because you take too big a step. And then when you can't re- recognize that as direction, moving in the direction of the thing you want, you say, well, I, did, I couldn't do it, and you quit. So the work You just of, taught yourself to disempower yeah, yourself. You just proved you can't do it. I am so Vendura. good at proving that I can't do yeah, things, yeah, you yeah. guys. It's all about, you know, you pick a goal, but you make really, really small incremental steps. So we call it the set the bar low method. Like, just set the bar low and clear it. You'll feel a little piece of accomplishment. You get a little blast of endorphins in your brain. Then do it again. Then do it again. So you don't change your job by, you know, screaming and yelling at your boss and, and throwing your, you know, your uh, ID on the floor and then walking out, storming past the guards, you take a, you assess where you are, you take a couple of small steps, you prototype your way into things. By the way, a lot of times people want stuff, and when they get it, they find out, oh, it wasn't what I thought it would be. Know That's the funny thing about know desire, right? Yeah, yeah. because you not what I had in mind. Trick. Because nobody, nobody tried it first. So prototyping is just a way of sneaking up in the future and seeing if it's really going to be what you think it is. And when you adopt these mindsets, like first I start with curiosity because I don't know what the future is going to be. So what am I trying to analyze anyway? I've got no data. I've got to go talk to people. I've got to try little experiments called prototypes. And I can pretty quickly find a method for finding my way forward in this kind of fog of uncertainty. And more often than not, designers invent something that's really cool. And you can invent something really cool called your next job, your next life, your next thing. And if it's true that we're going to live to be 100 and we're going to have to get really good at this because, yes, the robots are coming and AI is coming and we're going to have to reinvent our job anyway. But the good news is, don't you, don't you hope there's a really cool job that hasn't been invented yet that you're going to be doing 10 years from now? That'll be even cooler than what you're doing? Dave and Bill have each had so many chapters personally, and they plan to have a few more. We're going to take a quick break here. Coming up, we'll talk about what's in our control and what's not. Now back to our show. The last two years have taught us that we can't control very much about what's going on around us. You can do all the right things. You can put everything in place to change. But then you have to trust the process here, too. That's a big part of reinvention. Here, I think about talking to Glennon Doyle, the writer and activist. In the spring of 2020, it was right after her book Untamed had come out and before it had become a global phenomenon. Now, if you follow Glennon, you know that things worked out pretty well for her professionally. Her book was on the New York Times bestseller list for more than a year. She launched a popular podcast. But when I spoke to her, none of this had happened yet. I'd attended the first stop on her book tour at a church in Brooklyn. It turned out that it was the only stop. She'd had to cancel the tour. The tour being canceled was one thing. That wasn't the biggest thing. I mean, Amazon is not shipping books right now. Oh my gosh. You know what? I really did not think about that. Yesterday morning, I was on the phone with my team and they were crying. Like, these are grown, badass women. The trauma that people are in right now and then trying to keep their jobs going... So we'll spend, you know, a week like, okay, so how can we keep getting this message out online, right? We can keep this going online. And then we wake up and Amazon's not shipping. Like, yeah, (laughs) yeah, I can't apparently beat a global pandemic. There is a moment where you just realize, okay, what I have known deeply for the last week is I have to stop caring about my book for a little while. Like I will. I love it so much. I believe it has a destiny. I believe it will help people. I, but right now, what my community needs for me is for me to show up and just be a voice of comfort and safety and hope. So that's what I'm doing. I think that everybody who is doing any sort of project in the world right now realizes that that what's happening right now it's causing this huge shift where everything is falling away, all of our plans, all of that stuff. And it's just like, okay, how can we show up for each other right now? Not our product, not our whatever. Like, how can we really connect and get people through the trauma of this? What if you do the next true, the next right thing, eventually it all comes right. 
I've held on to this idea, and maybe it's because I've also watched a lot of Frozen 2 with my toddler recently. I can kind of hear Kristen Bell sing it in my head. It's an elegant directive. Do the next right thing. Especially in times when there's so much ambiguity that it's tough to have much long-term vision. It feels like none of the rules apply anymore. Every rule that I thought was static and unbreakable, even my most creative self could not challenge. Uh, It doesn't apply anymore. So that leaves us to figure out how to listen to ourselves because that is the only way that we're going to have any order. The only order is going to come from within. And that's an uncomfortable place to be. Yeah. And it's also such an opportunity, right? I mean, I do think that's weird because the main message of the book and the main message of my life has been, okay, we have been trained to look outside of ourselves for um, expectations about how we're supposed to create the life we create and the family that we create and the relationships that we create and the companies we create and the governments we create, all of it, right? But I think that this part of my life is teaching me that like it didn't work for me. I did all those things right. I was a good girl and I was a good woman and I was a good Christian and I was a good wife and I was a good mother and I was freaking miserable. So um, it, it took me a while to figure out that all those goods, it's okay to want to be a good everything. You just have to define what good is for yourself, right? Because if you're defaulting to somebody else's idea of what's good, then it's always going to be a cultural idea of what's good. And for women, it is always going to be in one way or another, disappear, be quiet, get smaller, stop making us uncomfortable. However you define like the expectation, it will be one version of that. And the only way to let go of those expectations and ideals is to go within, right? Because everything, all the messages we get outside of what to do, they're not pure. They're not from us. They're created by people who are trying to control us. So the only way though to do that is to get still, right? Is to start to block out all the other voices and do the, the difficult but simple work of going inside and being quiet and listening for that nudge and that knowing and that voice. When it comes to listening to your own voice, my favorite Hello Monday guest has definitely been Debbie Millman. Because sometimes that voice tells you what you should have done or where it thinks you should be. But sometimes, sometimes you can free yourself of the shoulds and really, truly hear yourself. Some people would say this takes confidence Debbie disagrees, and she also has an exercise for us. It's one that I want to leave you with as we start the year again. I think going back to the whole notion of confidence, and this is something I really learned from from Danny Shapiro, the writer. She had come to do an episode with me at my studio at the School of Visual Arts, and after the interview, she saw a stack of books about confidence on my desk in my office at that time in my life, I was thinking that confidence was the holy grail. (laughs) And so there were a whole slew of books that had come out and she saw the books and she said, oh, I think that confidence is really overrated. And as somebody that was seeking confidence as if it were the holy grail, I was sort of taken aback and shocked. And when I asked her to elaborate, she felt that she, she stated that she felt that ultimately confidence was something that only came after courage, that it was much more important to have courage to take that first step into the unknown than Mm -hmm. to be able to just manifest confidence through some sort of motivational inner language. Um, And so I, I do feel that that's true, that that courage to take a step into the unknown is is really the birthplace of creativity. Yeah. You know, I hear from a lot of listeners who they have a day job and it's a day job that pays the bills and it's fine, but they also have a more creative aspiration and they've kind of created a a mental picture, as it were, in which those two things have to be separate and they see the limits. They see the limits of their own abilities and capabilities. And and this goes to the courage piece. I thought a lot about in your interview with Tim Ferriss, toward the end of the interview, you talked about Milton Glaser and an exercise that he had done with you and that you subsequently do with your students. Do you know what exercise I'm talking about? The 10-year plan. The 10-year plan. I feel like our listeners need the 10-year plan. So I wonder <laughs> if you can if you can describe it. 
Well, the 10 year plan is an exercise that I've borrowed from Milton Glaser. Um, and it was something that I actually undertook back in 2005. In 2005, I was uh, still working at Sterling Brands, which is a company that I worked at for over 20 years and helped grow and help sell. And it was a huge, huge part of my life for a very long time. Um, and in 2005, I took a summer intensive with Milton Glaser at the School of Visual Arts. And it was really catered to mid-level professionals, people that were, that, that were seasoned um, but not so seasoned that they, they didn't need to be taught anything anymore. And um, I took it and it really changed my life. One of the exercises was to envision and write out how you could imagine your life to be five years into the future if you were doing exactly what you wanted to be doing, like every single thing from morning to night, you were instructed to write out every detail to make it as detailed as possible. And, and I, I'm, I'm a student that loves to learn. I'm the kind of person that really um, commits to assignments. And so I really put a lot of energy into this. And he, he asked us to do that and said that, in the 50 years that he'd been teaching at that point in his life, this was the most important class that he taught. And he was constantly hearing from students from decades prior who had also undertaken this exercise and had had miraculous results. And he said it was a very magical little exercise. So for, he, he really urged us to put our whole hearts and souls into it, which I did. And um, we had to share them at the end of the, of the intensive. And it was a moment of really declaring what you wanted your life to be in the future. And then lo and behold, and I, I made a list, let me tell you, I made a list. Not only did I make write an essay, which I put my whole heart and soul into, I also then made a list. I like I wanted it to be super clear. <laughs> These are the things that I want my life to be about in five years to in 2010. And so they were big, audacious goals, things that I didn't really think were possible, but wanted with my whole heart. And lo and behold, over the years, year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, things really started to manifest. Um, they really started to manifest in momentum about seven years later. Um, and then even most recently, now it's 15 years later, one of the one of the last remaining items on the list um, manifested, and so I decided, and, and Milton allowed me to do this when he stopped teaching, to incorporate this into my curriculum. But because my students were younger than the average age of Milton's classes, students in his classes, um, I decided to make it a ten year plan. Also, because I had lived through this process. I do think that it takes time. I think anything worthwhile takes time, and that given that. It's now taken me 15 years to manifest all of them that I want to give students a little bit more runway. Um, and so I made it a 10 year plan and I've been teaching it now for about 10 years. And I am always astounded like Milton when I get emails from my students or I see them and they tell me things that have manifested in their lives. So I think there's something about envisioning and declaring what you want that is indeed very, 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 very powerful. I mean, I do think it's a little bit of magic too, but I do think it's mostly about articulating and declaring what you feel you're worthy of being able to achieve. So I love this, Debbie. And and I will confess, I have done this exercise. I, oh, I did good. this exercise with a career coach about, about five years ago, actually. And and there's a reason why I asked you to describe this in connection with courage. Because first of all, um, I think that the real courage to do anything that we might want to do is to take that first step to envision it. And at least when I did the exercise, I don't know if it was like this for you or for your students. My first pass was kind of bland. It was... It was moderated by what I thought that I could probably do. So you know what I want to do? I want to write a book. Well, I'm going to dial that back. I want, I want to write an article. Like, <laughs> I'm going to write an article, right? Yeah. And, and it took a lot of pushing and a lot of discomfort 
to get to the point where I put aside everything I thought that I was capable of, listened to my internal compass and just wrote down every single thing that I wanted, even if I didn't think that it existed right away. And then that second part happened, which you called magic. I'm going to call it magic, too. And maybe it's magic that we ourselves create. But when you actually get it all down on paper, it kind of happens. Yeah. I don't exactly know how it happens. It seems to happen for a lot of people. I I put so much energy into the first go round that I didn't need to rewrite it. But because I allow my students to rewrite it, if they feel once they've heard others that they haven't really reached for everything that they wanted to rewrite it. And I would say a good number actually end up doing that. I ended up rewriting the, or redoing the exercise. I wouldn't say I was rewriting it, but in 2017, I rewrote the essay and in, 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 as to address the current times in the next stage of my life. And it's funny because a lot of people would say, oh, have you written another one? Because that one was so long ago. At that point, it was 13 years ago. And I kept saying, oh, I really want to, I really want to, but something was holding me back. And I had decided that I wanted to do it in 2017. And literally I did it on December 31st, 2017. Like I wouldn't make any New Year's Eve plans that year <laughs> because I had had this goal, I hadn't achieved it, and I needed to sit down and get it done. And I did. And I also put some very audacious goals in that and a few of them have manifested. So yeah, it's, there's something really wonderful about it. When, when I did the episode with Tim, one of his listeners went and transcribed the way I described the instructions and created a website called your10yearplan.com. And, and it's there for anybody that wants to follow the instructions. That's pretty rad. That's- <laughs> I, know, I was so, I was so <laughs> excited really cool. about it. I'm like, wow, look what somebody did. <laughs> That's where reinvention begins. We have to decide what we want. This is harder than you think. It takes imagination and the will to let go, first of all, of the constraints we put on ourselves. So many of you are in the process of doing this right now. So let's start the year by talking about it together. Join us for office hours this Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll go live from the LinkedIn news page. Or tell us what you think. Email us a voice memo at hellomonday at linkedin.com. We really love hearing from you. Just before the holidays, Andrew Hunt sent a note from his morning walk. You can hear the leaves rustling under his feet. He just listened to a couple of early episodes of the show, all about where our best ideas come from. And he shared his own process about where his best ideas come from. I get my ideas from living through an attempt at solving a problem. That's pretty much always the mechanism by which an idea occurs to me. I either change the solution or I realize that the reason I'm dissatisfied is that the solution, though a good one, does not address the actual problem, which was not at first apparent. Andrew, I liked this description of problem solving because that's my style as well. I need to see something in order to change it, to fix it, to find the new idea in it. And listeners, if you have thoughts things you want me to explore about reinvention, thoughts on your own 10-year plan, please send us your voice memos to hellomonday at linkedin.com. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show is produced by Sarah Storm with help from Taisha Henry. Joe DeGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Uriando is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Michaela Greer and Victoria Taylor reinvent the show constantly. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. We're back next Monday. Thanks for listening.